Hello, Fox fans. How are you doing? I wanted to share with you an extended sample of my second official audiobook. It is the first in a trilogy called The Keepers of the Stones from USA Today best selling author Tara West. It's young adult, fantasy, akin to a sort of blend between The Hobbit and Harry Potter, with also more than an ample dash of romance. So really, for Harry Potter fans, Lord of the Rings fans, and even fans of To Marry a Prince, I honestly, strongly recommend this story. And for those of you that just enjoy listening to me read whatever it is that I read, then of course, get a cup of your favourite beverage and enjoy what's to come next. But, enough of the introduction. Let's jump in. Curse of the Ice Dragon Keepers of the Stones Book One by Tara West Chapter One The Bond of Brothers Wait up! You know I cannot run as fast as you! We must hurry before father whips us for delaying his supper! Marcus threw a glance behind him, before coming to a halt. Alec had once again slowed their progress. Tossing his sling and the rabbit carcasses to the ground, Marcus went to help him. Although the onset of spring had thawed most of the perilous icy freeze, his brother's condition appeared to worsen with each melting snowcap. Alec clutched one hand to his chest, using the other to steady his slender frame against a pine tree. We both know I will be the one whipped, not you. Even more reason to make haste. Marcus grimaced, knowing his brother's words were true, but he could not understand why Alec was always the victim of their father's heavy hand. Father had only struck Marcus once, and that had been long ago. Mayhap father knew that if he beat Marcus, he'd risk injuring his drawback arm, and then there would be no more venison stew for supper. Even so, he hated seeing his brother abused. The red and purple splotches on Alec's pale arms and back were daily reminders that Marcus was the favourite child. He should have been grateful that it was Alec who attracted their father's wrath, but watching his brother degraded and hurt unleashed strange emotions inside him. Anger welled up in his heart every day he witnessed Alec's torment. Anger at their father. Anger at himself. Was it not Marcus's destiny to be a mighty hunter and a fearless leader? Hadn't he already been providing the village with most of the meat for their tables? Yet when it came to his father, why hadn't he the courage to stand up to him and defend his brother? Although Alec was almost twenty winters, and by all accounts old enough to be a man, he had the physique of a juvenile boy and was not strong enough to live on his own. Thus he was forced to endure their father's wrath in exchange for a warm bed and food. Hardly a life worth living. Marcus promised himself that when he came of age, he would make it up to his brother. They'd live in a hut of their own, and he would hunt for Alec, giving him all the choice meats. Alec would grow stronger then, and recover from his sickness. Until then... Do you wish me to carry you? Marcus asked. Standing over a head taller, he looked down as Alec coughed and wheezed through the rattle in his chest. Alec looked up, glaring. Carry me? Don't be foolish. You cannot carry me and you kill. But carrying Alec would be easy work. By his thirteenth birthday, Marcus had been blessed with the strength and size of a full-grown man. Now, almost three years later, he could toss his brother's hollow bones over his shoulder in one sweep. I've carried stags heavier than you, Marcus laughed. 
pale orbs beneath Alex's sunken sockets darkened. I just need a moment to catch my breath. Sometimes Marcus marvelled how Alec had lived so long as to reach his nineteenth birthday. Each night, Marcus had sent a silent thanks to the goddess for his brother's fortitude, for he truly did not know how he could go on living without Alec by his side. Leaning against the pine tree, Marcus's voice softened. One moment, then we must go. It is nearly time to eat, and I've not skinned the rabbits. A wolfish grin spread across Alec's face. Had you not stopped to spy, we would not be delayed now. Marcus felt a rush of heat burst forth from his chest and inflame his face. Diana was his one weakness, and he silently cursed his brother for alluding to her. I was not spying. Alec burst out laughing before he was forced to give in to a fit of coughs. Once his coughing had subsided, he looked at Marcus with a hint of mischief in his pale eyes. What would you call it, then? Folding his arms across his chest, Marcus exhaled a breath of frustration. What was it about that girl that confounded him so? Despite all of his efforts to help her, she refused paying him no more heed than the mould growing beneath her boot. Out of all the villagers, she should have desired his hunting skills the most. Her parents had been killed in an avalanche the previous winter, leaving Diana and her brother to fend for themselves. She's stubborn. I was just making sure she and her brother do not starve. Alec shook his pale head. I saw the skin of dough hanging from a nearby tree. A small doe, Alec shrugged. Tis all they need. I could have killed a bear for her. A surge of anger infused Marcus's skull. Pushing away from the tree, he picked up the rabbits and marched toward home. Girls were so foolish. Why did men see any use for them? They've no <coughs> need for that much meat, called his brother from the distance while coughing through his words. Storming through the darkened forest, Marcus easily dodged the perilous, winding roots that snuck up from the ground, threatening to trip the hapless wanderer. But he'd travelled this path since he was old enough to draw back a bow. He knew he should slow his pace, but anger fueled his movements, and he was in no mood to be ribbed by his brother. It was not in Alec's nature to tease him, unless the topic strayed to Diana. She wastes her time on the hunt when all she needs is to ask me, he growled, trudging heavily along the well-worn path to their hut. <sighs> May mayhap she likes the hunt. Marcus whipped around to face his brother, who had remarkably kept up with his fast stride. She's a girl, he spat. Girls do not like hunting. Alec levelled him with a smug smile. Is that so? Marcus wasn't sure he liked his brother's cocky attitude. Alec was the more intelligent of the two for sure, and he didn't want to be reminded of his superior wit. What do you know about girls? Marcus wished the venomous words back as soon as they'd slipped off his tongue. Despite Alec's every effort, girls refused to pay him any heed. Maidens wanted strong husbands who could keep their family well fed. That's why Marcus had no shortage of admiring females. They practically flung themselves at his feet. Well, all except Diana. <laughs> More than you, it would seem, Alex snickered, ignoring his brother's attempts to silence him. You should have let me kill that stag, Marcus grumbled as he spied the clearing through the trees. I would have left it at her door. It is a good thing father does not let me go on your hunts. Otherwise you'd have killed the whole forest by now. Do not waste the lives of our woodland creatures. Marcus rolled his eyes at the change in his brother's tone. Sometimes he acted more like a parent than a sibling. I do not need another lecture from you on the preservation of species. Where are those damn boys? The familiar roar sliced through the frigid air sending shards of ice-cold fear to the marrow of Marcus's bones. 
Why did his father affect him that way? Why did he allow his father to affect him that way? We're here, father, he called back, regretting the crack of fear that broke through his strained voice. Trudging through a new growth of snake moss, he led the way toward their small hut. A fire kindled through the smoke hole, and freshly washed shirts and trues dangled from a weathered rope. A small patch of newly ploughed soil graced one side of the hut. Beneath the majestic backdrop of the snow-capped mountain peak, all would have seemed perfect on this tiny plot of land. Save for him. Almost as wide as a great snow bear, though not as tall, for a snow bear was easily twice Marcus's height, and twice as mean, Rowland had no patience for anything save brewing his many pots of ale. His mouth was draped with a permanent scowl, and an acerbic bite of condescension seemed to linger at the end of every word that dripped off his venomous tongue. Eyes darker than stone reflected the contents of his heart, cold and impenetrable. The only things harder than his heart were his meaty fists when they pummeled Alec, almost a daily occurrence. When he was little, Marcus learned to recognise the loathing gleam in his father's eyes just before he was about to strike, knew the exact time to run. When there was no place to hide, Alec would shield Marcus's body with his own. Though it didn't matter, Roland was only after Alec's blood. As he grew older, Marcus became more aware of rumours circulating about him. He'd been born with the mark of the Great Hunter. He would free their people from starvation. Over the past few winters, rumour had turned to reality. As if by a miracle, the more he honed his skills, the more the animals flocked to the forest. At first their father was proud, boasting to the whole village how his son had saved them from famine. And for a short while, Roland was happy. With their father's lighter mood, Alec was spared his cruelty. But his mild temper was short-lived, and the abuse would begin again. Marcus blamed himself. He thought mayhap father wasn't pleased with his hunt. Mayhap if he harvested more animals, father would spare Alec. But now it seemed that with each fresh kill, Roland used Marcus's success against Alec, chiding his oldest son for his incompetence. Dropping an axe on top of a pile of wood, father strode over to them in long, heavy steps never tearing his fiery glare from Alec's feeble frame. Do you purposely mean to make me wait for my supper? Tis my fault, <coughs> father, Alec said, coughing into his hand. I had to stop for breath. Marcus's limbs turned to ice, and his eyes darted to his father, bracing himself for his angry reaction. Great goddess! Why had his foolish brother taken the blame upon himself? Rubbing one thick hand through his scraggly, greying beard, Roland eyed Alec with a sneer. I do not know why I allow such a weakling to attend my son on the hunt. Do you forget I am your son too? Marcus felt the anger in Alec's shaky voice and could only stare at him in awe. How oh, Dare you speak to me in that way? Roland raised his hand to strike. Father, wait! Marcus jumped between the two men, surprised at his own act of courage. I need Alec to help me skin the rabbits. Growling under his breath, Roland lowered his arm. Put him to work, son. He is of no use to me. Marcus turned and with a shaky hand he grabbed his brother by the elbow and led him to the skinning shack. Still puzzled at how he was able to stand up to father, his elation was short-lived. 
This meagre defiance meant nothing when so much damage had already been done, when so much violence was still to come. What would he have done if father had pushed him aside and struck Alec? Would he have defended his brother? Probably not. His quivering innards reminded him that he was a coward. After they had reached the shack and lit the oil lamp, Marcus turned to his brother and grumbled, Why do you lie for me? Had Alec not lied, Marcus would not have been forced to defend him. For that he was angry, but most of all he was angry with himself for his cowardice when it came to standing up to their father. Alec dropped his shoulders, a wry grin crossing his face. I don't know. I wish you'd stop, Marcus growled before turning his back on his brother and tossing the rabbit carcasses on the skinning table. Pulling the boning knife out of his belt, he grabbed a rabbit and pierced the animal just below the belly. Why? Alec hissed at his back. So he can beat you? Well, don't provoke him then. Marcus bit his lip before he had said too much, before he admitted his fears. He sliced the blade up to the rabbit's neck, and the blood from the exposed flesh warmed his shaking hand. Taking a deep breath, Marcus forced himself to relax, putting all of his effort into skinning the rabbits and trying to block out the memory of his father's face and the sound of his voice. For a brief moment, he savoured the stagnant air, smelling of blood from all of the animals he had slaughtered on the weathered, red-stained skinning table. The pungent odour of the freshly killed rabbit carcasses blended with the old blood. To some, the smell would have been overpowering, but to Marcus, the stench brought an unexplained sense of peace. If he'd acknowledge me as his son, and treat me as a human, then mayhap I wouldn't. Marcus sighed. His brother's words refused to allow him to push the image of father from his mind. Besides, Alec was right. Why did father hate him so? It was not Alec's fault that he'd been born with an infirmity, and father's daily beatings did nothing to improve his condition. But at least Alec had the one elixir that neither Marcus nor father could lay claim to. Mother's gentle touch, her soft, soothing voice, and tender smile. It is no special honour, his throat tightened with emotion. At least you have our mother's love. Marcus ripped open the rabbit's flesh at each extremity with brutal strokes, slicing his way toward the belly before hacking off each foot. After cutting off the tail, he pulled the pelt of the rabbit up over its neck. Father had repeatedly told him it wasn't mannish to savour the soft caresses of a woman, but how he longed for Mother to brush her fingers across his cheek, to hold him and stroke his hair as she did with Alec. But Marcus's hair was as black as the night sky, and coarse like straw, unlike the soft, pale wisps of his brothers. And he was far too large to fit in the cradle of their mother's arms, while Alec could still fold his slender frame into her lap without crushing her. Of course, Mother only showed affection to Alec when Father was in the barn, drowning himself in brew. Alec would come into the hut with a fresh bruise, his eyes pulled with moisture, and Mother would open her arms to him. Marcus had no choice but to turn away, an aching in his heart, for he never knew that kind of love from his mother. She loves you too, brother, said Alec placing a steady hand on his shoulder. Father forbids her from showing it, is all. Marcus exhaled a long breath, choking back the rising tide of anger. That I cannot accept. The great hunter cannot be fierce if he is coddled. Alec mimicked their father's stentorian tone. In one swift stroke, Marcus chopped off the head of the rabbit. It rolled down the gentle slope of the table and landed in a bucket. Blood pooled from the empty cavity. 
I wish I never had such skill. I wish I was more like you. Tossing the blade aside, Marcus turned toward Alec. Eyes narrowing, Alec's gaze intensified. Do you wish for every breath to be a struggle? To be weak and infirm, and hardly a man even at nine and ten winters? You are the strongest man I know, Alec. It takes strength and courage to stand up to our father. And your kindness to me. His voice quavered as he dropped his gaze. I do not understand. You are my brother. Alec gripped Marcus by both shoulders, looking up into his face with a pained expression. What is there to understand? Marcus shrugged and swallowed the lump in his throat that seemed to originate from a hollow pit in his belly. He beats you, even for my mistakes. A lesser man would despise me. You have good in you, despite our father's best efforts to make you a monster. I do not stand up to him as you do. I do not defend you as I ought. You might be as strong as an ox, but you are a lad still. Your time will come, brother. Alec's voice cracked before he coughed into his hand for several interminable seconds. Finally, Alec righted his posture and looked at Marcus with a glazed-over expression. On the night you were born, I made a promise to the goddess that I would teach you compassion. A promise I will give my last dying breath to uphold. This is why I scold you when you kill more than you can eat. A kind hunter respects those animals he kills and does not take their lives unnecessarily. Marcus turned back to his kill. Picking up the knife, he cut through the meat of the rabbit before ripping open the ribcage with the tip of his blade. Aye, brother, but when I see an easy target, I cannot stop the blood that pumps through my veins, driving me to kill the beast. It is a feeling I cannot explain. With a hand on Marcus's back, Alec breathed at barely a whisper. You must not surrender to your impulses. Repressing the urge to laugh at his brother's request, Marcus pulled down the animal's innards before ripping them free of its body. A smile crossed his face as the gutting was finally finished. All that was left were meat and bones for the stew. I cannot help it, he shrugged before tossing the organs in the bucket. Alec stood speechless behind him, leaving nothing between them but the wheezy sound of his strained breathing and the odour of fresh blood. Finally, he cleared his throat. Killing comes too easily to you, Marcus. It would seem your gift is more of a curse. Chapter 3 a small campfire kindled beneath the heavy overhang of several towering pines. A lone hunter sat near the blaze, warming his fingers as the chill from the darkening sky seeped into his bones. Although he was far from his family's hut, this was where Marcus felt most at home. The forest was his salvation, the place he could go to to escape his father's dark moods. The quiet moments he spent by the fire after a successful hunt were his most cherished times. He could recount the day's hunt, remembering the adrenaline pumping through his veins just before he released his arrow, always striking true. That night's hunt had been fruitful, an elk, a hawk, and one pesky squirrel. The elk carcass hung on a nearby tree, blood dripping from the hollow cavity. Marcus planned to harvest the choicest meats for his family. The hawk had been stripped, his breast roasted on a spit above the fire. The squirrel, however, served only to amuse Marcus, as he desired a guest to accompany him this dark night. The bushy-tailed animal sat across from him, his body propped up by a few small rocks, so he looked as if he was resting his bones beside the fire. Dried spatters of blood had emptied out of a hole in his chest. Though he did not always eat the entire carcasses of the animals he harvested, 
Marcus would usually make use of the parts he needed for the hunt. Sinews to fasten a broadhead to the shaft of an arrow and for stringing his bow, feathers for fletching the veins upon his arrows, and leather to protect his fingers when releasing the string. Marcus liked to sit by the campfire and work with his tools. Tonight he was engrossed in flint-napping stone, carving broadheads out of mere rocks. Sharp broadheads and a perfect aim were what made his arrows so deadly. He'd pour all of his energy into crafting one tip well into the dawn. To focus on this simple act of carving stone took all of his concentration, leaving no time for dark thoughts of his father. He was particularly determined to drive any dispiriting thoughts from his mind, knowing that when he returned home at dawn, he'd have to face Alec's pain, mother's scorn, and father's wrath. Mayhap it was because he was so engrossed in driving away his demons that Marcus did not hear the footfall until the man was already behind him. At the snapping of a twig, Marcus leapt up from his log, knife in hand. He was met by the familiar weathered eyes of the healer. Marcus lowered his guard and sheathed his knife, having been used to visits from the old man on the many occasions that Alec was unable to rise from his bed. Looking into the smiling face of Dafois, Marcus was reminded of a weathered map, as many tributaries were etched in his leathered features. Marcus wondered the age of the healer, whom some called a prophet. His father had told Marcus that Dafwa had been there at his birth, and foretold he would be a mighty hunter. Though none knew Dafwa's age, he was rumoured to be as old as Ice Mountain. As a boy, Marcus had always thought each line on Dafwa's face represented a year, but the healer would never sit long enough for him to count them all. Now the white-haired man had come to him this night. Marcus hoped Dafwa would sit with him by the fire and mayhap recount stories of old that would chase away the gnawing fear welling in his heart. Dafwa's soft eyes held Marcus's for a long moment before his gaze dropped to the fire, the sharp edges of his face cutting into a deep frown. Without waiting for an offer, the healer took a seat beside the squirrel, pulling up the hem of his robe and stretching his bony legs beside the fire. This squirrel's offences must have been great. Marcus gave pause, reflecting on the healer's words and actions. Simply being ancient did not give the healer the authority to judge Marcus. I am a hunter. It is my job to kill animals, replied Marcus, settling on a log opposite the old man. Dafwa turned to the sitting squirrel with a grimace. Do hunters not skin animals as well? Waving away the healer's words with a flick of the wrist, Marcus could not shake his growing annoyance at the condescending tone in the old man's voice. I am not in the mood for squirrel tonight. The healer's bushy brows rose, and he rubbed his pointed chin with a gnarled hand. A hunter takes a life to feed himself and his people. If you do not eat what you kill, you are no hunter. I am the greatest hunter in all the land, Marcus barked. I have killed up to ten animals in one hunt. Had Dafwa come to seek companionship or pass judgment? Marcus had had enough aggravation for one day. I have not heard of so many deaths since the last plague. The dark, stony depths of the healer's eyes seemed to pool over with the reflection of distant memories. Perhaps that is what you are, a sickness of some kind. Marcus bit back a curse, his patience growing as taut as a newly strung bow. I am no sickness, but I am growing ever sick of you, old man. Do you seek my fire for warmth or for foolish jests? Dafwa's eyes grew darker still the lines around his mouth drawing into a grim line. Bending his crooked frame toward the fire, shades of the burning embers 
cast an eerie glow upon his face. I seek your fire tonight to warn you. Marcus's heartbeat stilled as he choked out the question. Warn me? I, the healer nodded, of Medea's great ice dragon. Shaking his head, Marcus considered the prophet's words. Ice dragon? Was the old man daft? Had his mind finally withered to dust? He thought mayhap Dafwar had sought to warn him of some new evil deed by his father, rather than feed him some silly tale of a mythical dragon. He had heard stories of an ice dragon from his brother. Alec had told Marcus that Medea imprisoned the dragon beneath an impenetrable tomb of ice. The last time Medea released her monster was hundreds of years ago, when it destroyed an entire village for blaspheming the goddess. With widened eyes, Dafwa sat upright. His face seemed transfixed by a spell. The dragon is called Lydra, a monster so fierce and foul, few men have seen her and lived to tell. Is that so? Crossing his legs at the ankles, Marcus folded his arms across his chest. Tell me more of this, Lydra. The healer threw his arms wide. More than twice the girth of a snow bear. She stands five men in height. Chuckling beneath his breath, Marcus could not contain a smile. Though the old man was irritating, he was amusing. And does she breathe fire like a dragon? Dafwa's stare became blank, expressionless. Not fire. Ice. Colder than the darkest winter storm. He raised a bony finger to the deep lines that cut channels into his left eye. The fire is in here. Marcus's smirk widened. Her eyes? Ay, red and glowing like the molten depths of hell. The healer almost hissed the words as though he was actually recalling the memory of a real ice dragon. I see, Marcus decided to humour the healer and go along with the jest. So, do you wish me to fell Lydra with my bow? Dafwa shook his head. I am afraid you cannot. You are mistaken, said Marcus, jutting out his chin. He thumped his chest with a fist. There is no fowl or beast I cannot kill. The healer cast his gaze heavenward, before fixing Marcus with a penetrating glare. I am sure you are able to kill her, but you cannot kill her. Shifting in his seat, his rising irritation infused his skull. This so-called prophet was too old for his liking. Do not speak to me in riddles, Marcus growled. Speak plainly, or warm your bones elsewhere. Dafwa reacted by closing his eyes, mumbling what sounded like an incantation. Was this some strange spell? Or had the healer come to him tonight to play tricks on him? Either way, Marcus had had enough. Rising to his feet, he was going to make Dafwa leave by force. He gasped as the old man's eyes shot open. Deep within his sunken orbs, Marcus thought he saw red. Dafwa's incantations grew louder, until Marcus could finally discern the lyrics of a poem. One fell shot from the bow, and many will know. Medea's curse has descended. Omens will fall to family, and all the cruel hunter has befriended. For each life he claims, his kin suffers the same death by similar strand, for she will allow no beast nor fowl to be hunted by his hand.
to the hunter who reaps his fill of kill, and nary none from need. Beware her beast who wakens to feast on avarice and greed. Eyes that glow like burning coals in the embers of demons' fury. Breath so cold, Lydra freezes the souls of any at her mercy. Sad is the tale that is known so well, the hunter who slaughtered with pleasure. His heartless crime was recompensed for discarding the forest's treasure. Once again, the healer closed his eyes, and when they reopened, he shook his head and blinked several times, acting as if he'd woken from a dream. Marcus remained standing, his feet like granite stones planted firmly on the ground. Fear had sent ice through his limbs and weighted his body to the spot. Had Dafwa really had some kind of vision? If the man's intentions were to spook him, he'd clearly succeeded. With clenched fists, he spoke through gritted teeth. Your parables are not amusing. Dafwa's shoulders slumped, and he cast his gaze upon the logs of the fire. I do not speak to amuse. Beware the hunter who kills for the sake of killing. The goddess will unleash upon him a curse. For every animal he slaughters, one he cares for will die the same death. Nonsense! Marcus roared. The prophet sighed. She shall free Lydra, her great dragon, from her icy prison. The hunter will become the hunted, and though the mighty hunter possesses the skill to pierce the solid scales of the dragon, if he fells the beast, the one he loves most will breathe his last breath. Marcus finally found the courage to move, marching up to the healer, bearing down upon him with a scowl. It is a fool's tale you weave. It is a fool who does not heed my warning, the healer responded, rising to his feet. His elderly body seemed more fragile than when he'd approached the fire. Dafwa resembled the twisted root of a tree, fighting the confines of his worldly prison. With his features hung low, his aged eyes belied his sadness. Turning a weak smile upon Marcus, the healer placed bony fingers on his thick shoulder and patted once before his hand fell to his side. I thank you for the warmth of your fire, mighty hunter. These old bones have rested too long. Without another word, Dafwa walked away slowly, rhythmically, as if marching to the drum of a funeral procession. Into the night he went, until his ancient form was shrouded in darkness. Chapter 7 Under the mystic glow of pale lights, Medea sat on her ornate ice throne, looking down into the swirling mists. Try as she might, she could not summon forth an image of her dragon. Lydra was lost for now, trapped under the crush of heavy snow. The foolish beast had failed her. Cursing, she slapped the vortex of spinning vapour, scattering wisps of clouds across the stones. Medea was tired this night, and her magic was draining, but she needed to know what had become of the boy. With one final attempt, she spun her hand around the circle of stones beneath her, calling forth her vision spell, until a faint image of the boy hunter appeared. He looked too much like his father, with coarse midnight hair and a thick, square jaw. 
Her wingtips twitched and hummed as her mind conjured up images of the one night she'd spent in the cradle of Roland's strong arms. Roland, why did you leave me? Lydra is trapped, my deity. Her servant, Jay, a beautiful girl with long coppery curls that fell just below her waist, stood at the threshold of the throne room, her feet obscured by a soft fog rising from the floor. Yes, I know about the dragon, Medea answered flatly, as her wings drooped at her sides. Unable to mask her annoyance, Medea waved away the servant with a flick of her wrist. Jay stood grounded to the spot, while she levelled Medea with the direct gaze of her tapered amber eyes. The girl was bold. Her insolence would have to be dealt with. Soon. Medea knew it was her beauty that made the servant so. She too had been that way once, when the allure of her ivory hair and vivid green eyes were matched by no woman. Medea had been a youth then, though it seemed only a few winters ago. But once her heart had been shattered into a thousand splintering ice crystals, her beauty died with it. Her death from within from the plague that ate at her soul, crept outward, gnawing at her flesh until naught was left but the wrinkled skin of an old woman. But Medea had had her revenge, the curse she put upon Roland's heart before he descended. His young bride and sickly son did not know he would return a monster. Now that he was dead, the last remnants of Medea's heart had withered to dust, but she would mourn silently. The elementals need not gain another reason to doubt her powers. Do you wish me to release the pixies? asked Jay, waving a hand toward the dark, deep void in the wall behind Medea's throne. Upon hearing their names, an eruption of squeals began. Thousands of pixies, each no bigger than a child's fist, screamed from behind an iron grate for their release. No, girl, Medea leered at her servant from beneath pale lashes and silenced the pixies with a wave of her hand. Jay's eyes bulged. My goddess, please do not tell me you will waste your magic. Do you dare tell me what to do? Rising, Medea slammed her fists against the stones. The girl worried for nothing brainwashed by the elementals of the ice coven. Medea knew her magic was not waning. The ice was not melting. Her towering pillars of frozen crystallines had withstood over ten thousand winters, and they would protect them for thousands more to come. Forgive me, my goddess. Casting her gaze downward, Jay bit her lower lip. Sighing, Medea sank into the furs lining her throne. She was tired and needed rest. By morning, her magic would be revived. Why should I release the pixies or use my magic? Narrowing her eyes, she looked down at the circle of stones as the boy's image faded away. I give him no more than another day. The boy hunter will not survive my mountain. Useless gloves! Marcus cursed as he tossed the soft doeskin leathers off the ledge, watching as they disappeared through the clouds and into the abyss. He had once admired them for their supple, smooth texture, and they had taken him nearly a fortnight to make. He remembered fondly how he sewed each stitch with care, something not easily done with large, clumsy fingers. But they were no good to him now. The gloves had nearly cost him his life, the slick leather gave him no purchase when he was pulling himself up on an equally slick rope. Had it not been for the knot he'd tied at the end of it, he would have slid right off. Luckily, he'd been able to lower himself onto a ledge below, only banging his shin twice in the process. The rope dangled now, just above Marcus's head. He would pull himself back up once he'd caught his breath. His body was already numbing to the pain inflicted on him by the mountain. Cuts and bruises mattered little to him now. 
He had barely flinched when he crushed his knuckles with the blunt end of his axe. That had just been another foolish, clumsy mistake. Marcus had only started the climb this morn, so he knew he'd make many more errors of judgment. Exactly how far he'd scaled he knew not, for a low mist had settled on the mountain, blocking out the midday sun and obscuring his vision past an arm's length, making the climb more treacherous than before. But he had to continue. Stopping only gave him time to think. His thoughts were turning much darker, much more dangerous than the climb. How easy it would be to jump over the ledge and end his life. No more curse, no more dragon, no more memories of father. Besides, he wasn't man enough to scale a mountain. He would slip up again, mayhap next time he wouldn't have a ledge to save him. How many more mistakes would he make before he lost his life? Why not end it swiftly now? How foolish he'd been to think he could ever reach Medea. Biting back a sardonic laugh, his father's words reverberated through his skull. Only fools scale mountains. This was what father had told him three winters ago, when he'd first asked for climbing lessons. Marcus had wanted to learn, not for the glory and thrill of the climb, but because mother had once told Alec that climbing had been father's passion. Foolishly, Marcus had thought if father climbed again, it would lighten his mood, and he would no longer be to Alec. They'd spent the first day waiting out a blizzard, cramped in a crude shelter they dug in the snow. On the second day they made little headway, as Marcus was barely a juvenile and had hardly enough strength to pound a pick through thick ice. By the third day they had been stalled by another blizzard, Father had drained the last of his brew, so it was time to descend. They'd made it home on the fifth day. Alec had been spared father's cruel beatings for five days, but the monster more than made up for it later by taking his frustration with the mountain out on Alec. Marcus then hated himself for suggesting the climb. Never again had he asked father for lessons. Now, Marcus was stuck on the side of a mountain, with little skill and only crude essentials for climbing. A cold, relentless wind slapped his face, gnawing into his flesh like a wolf with a bone. Soon it would be nightfall, and he would need to find a ledge wide enough to sleep on. Would the fur that Zaya provided him be thick enough to ward off the night's chill? A thought struck him that mayhap he had needed those gloves if for no other purpose than for added warmth while he slept. Damn! What else could go wrong this day? As if the mountain was answering his thoughts, Marcus heard a sharp crack and his body shook. He was nearly thrown off his perch by the sudden tremor below him. The ledge was unstable. Looking above his head to where the rope had been hanging, Marcus cried out in desperation. It was now more than an arm's length away. The ledge was sliding. Instinctively, he lunged for the side of the mountain, grabbing cracks in the ice without the aid of a pick or rope, or any lifeline. The brittle ice sliced through his bare hands as he clawed against the surface, trying desperately to pull himself toward the rope while the ledge crumbled beneath him. It was no use. The ice was too slick. Blood gushed from his fingers, spilling onto the wall as he slid awkwardly down the face. It was only a matter of time before the ice purged him from the mountain. How far he would have to slide before landing he was uncertain, for he'd no idea of the distance he'd travelled. But he knew the drop would be far enough to crush his bones. Then, as if stuck in a waking dream, Marcus lost hold of the mountain, and he slipped into oblivion. He reached out, grasping at the emptiness, before the image of his brother's pale face flashed through his memory. With Alec's name on his lips, he cried out as the agony of his loss shot daggers of pain through his extremities. 
death was certain. Closing his eyes to the horror, he jarred against a hard surface and a sickening crack ricocheted through his skull. Then his world darkened. Desrin's limbs trembled as he watched the older boy's chest rise and fall in erratic waves. The only sounds in the cabin were the fluid rattle of the boy's strained breathing and the heavy beating of Desrin's own heart. He still couldn't believe they were inside the monster's home, beside the darkened hearth of their sworn enemy, Roland Jaegerson, father of the boy hunter who brought on Medea's curse. Desrin, known simply as Des to his friends, and his sister had already found cruel Roland's corpse laying face down in the dirt. Spotting the giant winged dragon flying over the forest, breaking trees apart with its massive talons as if they were mere twigs, they had suspected the boy hunter to have been killed as well. When the two siblings came across a fresh gravesite with a wreath of flowers, they realised the mother had been killed by the curse, leaving the sick boy alone. It had been Desi's idea to go inside and look for the boy, and after much pleading, his sister reluctantly agreed. Does he breathe? Des whispered over his sister's cloaked shoulder as he gawked at the boy's bloody and swollen arm. Diana placed a slender hand on the side of the injured boy's neck. Aye, Des, but barely. I doubt he will survive the night. Unless you save him, Des begged. We could bring him back to our hut while he recovers. Though he could not make out his sister's features beneath her hood, Des could tell by the sudden stiffness in her shoulders that she was displeased with his idea. And when his arm is miraculously healed and he is no longer played with sickness, then what? I will be marked as a witch, she replied with a barely audible hiss. They will not know it was you. Diana turned to face Des and pulled down her cloak revealing vivid, emerald eyes that shone even in the darkness, as if a fire blazed beneath their depths. She reached out and clasped his hands within her own. Even in the cool night air, Diana's palms were always warm, as if she were impervious to the elements. Squeezing her brother's hands until warmth flooded into his body, she replied, I cannot take that risk. What if the villagers sacrifice me to Medea? Who will look after you then? Des shook his head. Almost everyone thinks the boy got sick because of his father's beatings. They will think his father's death is the reason why the boy healed. Diana chewed on her lip before casting an anxious glance at her brother. But what if this boy betrays me? What if he says I used magic to heal him? Des's heart hammered in his chest at the thought. What would he do if the villagers sacrificed Diana to the goddess? They had worked so hard to conceal her secret. Would their act of kindness be met with betrayal and cruelty? No, he refused to believe this sick boy was anything less than kind. He had witnessed the compassion that the boy had bestowed upon his undeserving younger brother, the cruel hunter who butchered animals. Des knew in his heart that this boy would show himself and Diana the same understanding. Des turned up his chin and met his sister's direct gaze. He will not betray you. She arched a brow before casting Des another wary glance. How can you be sure? I just know, Diana. Please, you cannot let him die. Chapter Twelve. Rin followed his father to the council's chamber. He glanced down at Tar, trotting beside him, and then at the land-dweller, who trailed in their wake, clumsily treading the ice like a newborn learning his first steps. Every so often, Rin and his father had to stop to give the brooding giants time to catch up. Why had father allowed Ura to take in this stranger? From what Rin had heard during his brave stay in Kaislin, the boy hunter had brought this dragon's curse on his head by abusing animals. Rin thought the punishment fit the crime, not that the ice witch needed a reason to curse anyone. 
For his father's sake, Rin had decided to tolerate his presence, but if the boy threatened any member of his family, Tar included, Rin would not hesitate to strike him down. Every muscle in Rin's body tensed as they crossed the frozen dock and neared the boat that would take them across Crystal Lake to the council's chamber. The lake sat at the heart of Ice Kingdom's darkest cavern, the ceiling of which was so steep and black that no one had ever dared to climb it. The cavern was illuminated by a few hanging ice crystals, which clung to the outer walls, and by the oarsman's lamp at the prow of the boat. After removing their spikes, Rin and his father stepped into the boat and sat together on the furthest bench. Without hesitation, Tar jumped in and settled on a fur-lined bench in the centre. Rin looked at the land dweller with raised brows and an expectant glare. The boy's sun-kissed skin suddenly took on the hue of ice as he shuffled from one foot to the next, his gaze darting from the boat to the smooth body of water they would need to cross to reach the council. Are you coming, Marcus? John asked. Rin laughed under his breath. The look in the boy hunter's eyes resembled that of a trapped animal. The land dweller shook his head. I doubt that boat would hold my weight. Ha <laughs> nonsense, Marcus, John chuckled, and then pointed to the opposite bench. This boat is sturdy. It was true, the boy was large, but Rin had seen up to six council members squeeze into the boat. Its bow was made of two hollowed-out tusks of a null and wrapped in its thick hide. Since it took a dozen hunters to take down the menacing beast, which was more than thrice the size of a giant snow bear, Rin knew that the boat was sturdy enough to hold the weight of the land-dweller. After a little more coaxing from John, Marcus sat on the bench opposite them, his hands clenched by his sides and his body so stiff that he looked like a stone statue. He nearly jumped out of his seat when the oarsman pushed off and began paddling across the glassy surface. While Rin suspected the water's smooth, dark depths could appear frightening to an outsider, he had seen much bigger bodies of water. In truth, Crystal Lake was the size of a large pond, but its inky reaches knew no limits. None of his people had ever dared to swim more than a few feet below the surface, and then only for a moment, as the frigid temperature was enough to kill a man within a few heartbeats. Many of the village fishermen had tried to gauge the water's extent, but their lines failed to reach the bottom. Rin watched with amusement as Marcus's hands shook by his sides. How is it that a lake exists here when all around us is ice? the boy asked. There is a thermal pocket beneath us, just warm enough to melt this pool of ice, John explained. As they crossed the centre of the lake, he waved to a small pinpoint of light deep below the surface. See the light there? Marcus swallowed. Could this be why your ice is melting? No, Rin replied. The thaw is not coming from within, but from outside. Marcus nodded before his gaze became transfixed on the water. I've seen bigger lakes, but none so dark or cold. He shuddered and then rubbed his arms. It is the calm that is most unsettling. Rin knew from his travels that many land dwellers were unsettled by the calm. There's a village named Alo Shea, where the land meets the sea. They have a saying that goes, Only fools set sail in tranquil waters. John hitched a brow. Why is this? The calm usually precedes the wrath of Eris. Eris? Who is she? John asked. This sea witch replied Rin, not bothering to mask the disdain in his voice. John's face twisted, making him look as if he had just swallowed raw serpent entrails. Another cursed witch? Yes, and some say she's even more vengeful than Medea. Rin remembered the spirit of the beautiful young woman he had seen from a distance. She had been cursed by Eris for her father's sins. Though she walked and talked, and by all appearances breathed as a mortal, she was nothing but wisps of air. Eris had stolen the girl's flesh and bones when she was only a babe. 
Though Rin did not know what sort of dark magic could rob a person of her body, yet allow her spirit to wander the land, he guessed that Eris's magic must be powerful. She was one witch that he had no desire to cross. When it came to Medea, on the other hand, he'd gladly sacrifice his flesh and bones just to bring about her demise. We are here, John announced, which gave Rin a reprieve from his dark thoughts as the boat reached the dock. Father and son helped Marcus to his feet, and they all disembarked, followed by Tar. John turned to Rin. After our meeting, we will retire to our dwelling. I wish to know all about your travels. In the meantime, please try to keep your composure with the council. Rin felt a prick of annoyance at his father's warning. How could he be expected to keep his composure? Somehow, he suspected that the council would deny his claims even if the ice beneath their souls turned to water. When John placed a steady hand on Rin's shoulder and levelled him with an expectant gaze, Rin grunted his understanding. Yes, he would try, but he would make no promises when dealing with fools. Entering the bright, icy chamber, Rin saw three men and two women, each stoic and silent, seated in a semicircle of elevated, fur-lined thrones. They were flanked on either side by four beefy guardians, peacekeepers of the kingdom, but more importantly, enforcers of the council's edicts. Each guardian wore thick, pale tunics and woolly leggings, strapped to their rust-coloured belts were the largest knives Rin had ever seen. Elof Errol, the council chieftain, sat in the centre on the widest chair, which was padded with the most furs to cushion his heavy weight. John, Tar, and Marcus lingered in the shadows near the entrance. Rin stood before the council, although he was blocked by a glowing pit that held a bright warming stone and a table laden with many kinds of spiced foods. Rin knew that running the kingdom was no easy task, but the council did not suffer from lack of nourishment and comfort. From the annoyed look in Chieftain Errol's squinty eyes, he had been waiting none too patiently. Most likely, he was eager to stuff his bloated face with food, thought Rin. And so he has returned. The chieftain splayed his arms wide, a look of mock enthusiasm in his features. Welcome home, son of the House of Nordland. Thank you. Rin made a slight bow though it pained his pride to do so. These fools deserve no respect from him. The chieftain waved his hand. John, uh, bring your land dweller forward. I'd like a look at him. His jaw fell open as Marcus stepped forth. Oh, my son did not lie. You were as big as a null. The land dweller's face flushed as he dropped his gaze to the floor. The council members broke into laughter. The chieftain's cousin, Ingrid Johan, who had an angular face and a sharp nose resembling a bird's beak, squealed so shrilly that Rin fought to shield his ears from the grating noise. Hearing Tar whimper behind him, he felt sorry for his dog, whose keen sense of hearing was so much better than his own. The chieftain jumped in his seat as his gaze narrowed on Tar. Oh, holy elements! What is that beast? The other members gasped, and Ingrid shrieked again. His name is Tar, Rin replied through clenched teeth. He is no beast, he is my friend. The chieftain sat back against his throne, his hands visibly shaking at his sides. <sighs> he looks like some kind of vicious slog. Rin heaved a sigh. I assure you, he's not vicious. Many land dwellers keep these animals as companions. They serve and protect their families. Is that so? The chieftain asked, scowling at Tar. How do you know he means no harm to our people? Rin dropped his gaze to his dog, who was too busy licking the fur around his anus to pay anyone much notice. He turned back to Chieftain Errol, who had been watching the dog with a look akin to horror. 
How was he ever going to convince these idiots that their foundations were melting? How would he impress upon them the gravity of their situation when the chieftain was so easily distracted by a butt-licking dog? Rin's shoulders fell as he rubbed his fingers across his temple. His head throbbed, and he knew it was not from the glacier kingdom's frigid air. It was the kind of headache that was brought on by stress. He bore too much responsibility at only two and twenty. When would these old fools listen? Tar saved my life. He would never harm our people. You have my word. The chieftain's eyebrows dipped beneath his silver hairline as he harumphed. Rin realised he would need to be extra careful and not give the council any reason to kill his companion. He would not put it past the chieftain and his vicious nature to want to cause his family pain. John! The chieftain's face contorted into one massive frown as he wagged a finger. We heard you've already brought this land-dweller to the Prophet before introducing him to us. Odu summoned us, John explained. A summons you didn't have to answer, Chief Errol replied with an air of indignity. For only the Council has the power to issue one. I am aware of the Council Code, Elof. Rin did not miss his father's defiance in calling the chieftain by his given name, even though his face and tone remained impassive. The chieftain turned away from John's steady gaze, his face flushing, and placed his malevolent glare upon the land-dweller. What is your purpose here, boy? Marcus's clenched fists shook as he spoke. My purpose? The chieftain made a grand show of turning in his chair and looking over each shoulder. <laughs> is there an echo in these walls? Again, the other members broke into noxious laughter. The land dweller tilted his chin. I am just trying to heal so I can climb to Medea. Chieftain Errol shook his head. Yes, I've heard about your fool plan to scale Ice Mountain and rid yourself of the witch's dragon. Marcus coloured. That is my plan. The chieftain broke into a wide grin. Sounds like a lovely trip. Be sure to send our greetings when you get there. The piercing laughter from the members was almost unbearable. Tar whimpered and lay down while covering his ears with his paws. Though Rin had no affinity for the land-dweller, the council's taunts pricked his ire. He had an overwhelming urge to rip off a sharp ice crystal and hurl it at the chieftain. After the laughter had died down, Chieftain Errol levelled Marcus with a sinister glare as his thin lips curled back in a feral snarl. While you are here with us, boy, know this. We... Here, in Ice Kingdom, follow a strict code, and those who disobey this code are dealt with by the Council. The chieftain nodded toward the Guardians. One act of violence against any of our people, and you shall be met with strict and severe justice. Do I make myself clear? Marcus's eyes widened, and his face paled making him look more like a frightened child than a hulking giant. I, he said in a weak voice, I suppose that is a yes. The chieftain arched back, never taking his heated gaze from Marcus. Nod, if you understand me. The land-dweller swallowed and did as he was told. Rin didn't know whether to feel pity for the boy or disgust. Good. Now go hurry up and heal. Chieftain Errol shooed Marcus away with an indifferent wave of his hand. You don't want to keep your beautiful witch waiting. Much to Rin's dismay, the squeals of laughter resumed. One member reached over and patted the chieftain on his back as the arrogant slog puffed out his meaty chest with a triumphant smug smile on his face. As Marcus stepped back into the shadows, Rin could hear his father murmuring to him. While he couldn't hear what was being said, he knew his father would try to soothe the land-dweller. When Rin was younger, 
how he had relished his father's gentle hand whenever he came to him with cuts and bruises. Now he saw his father's coddling as nothing more than a reckless indulgence. He would have to speak with John before he turned the land-dweller into a weakling. So, Rin, the chieftain said with a sneer, tell us of your adventures above the ice. Adventures? Rin clenched his fists by his side, trying his best to quell the flames of rage that kindled within. I did not surface merely for an adventure. Ah. The chieftain heaved an exaggerated sigh and slumped his soft body against the padded throne. So, more of your doomsday prophecies? Very well, then speak, for we have not gone to supper, and I, for one, am famished. He patted his huge gut. In that moment, Rin knew his warnings would fall on deaf ears. I do not know if what I have to say will do any good, he spat, for it seems you've already made up your minds. But I must warn you all that the ice melts. Soon our kingdom will be no more. The chieftain chuckled. <laughs> ice always melts come spring. History has taught us it is the way of the seasons above the surface. Yes, but not like this. Rin struggled to keep the anger out of his voice. Entire villages along the river have been washed away. The members gasped and whispered amongst themselves. Rin was pleased by their startled reactions. Surely they couldn't refute his evidence. But even then, the chieftain's booming voice silenced them all. Don't be fooled by the boy's tales. He seeks glory for himself and to reclaim his family's status. That is a lie, Rin roared. John grasped him by the shoulder. Rain in your temper, son. He would not rein in his feelings. He was tired of begging the council to understand, just as he was tired of the way his father bowed down to them. If it is status you seek, the chieftain continued, my son has already proved away. An alliance with the house of Errol. He heaved another sigh while rolling his eyes. <sighs> Though I cannot understand why he wishes to wed your sister when so many other esteemed families have offered their daughters. Esteemed families? Rin growled. What good will esteem do you when you are dead? The chieftain broke into a fit of laughter, and the other members chuckled alongside him. You are all fools! Rin stomped his foot, causing the ice beneath the padded floor to crackle. My family seeks an alliance with none of you. Very well, then. The chieftain shook his head, while waving Rin away with a flick of the wrist. The council has heard enough of your doomsday prophecies, son of Nordland. As Rin glared at the man who would sentence an entire kingdom to their deaths, rage like he'd never known infused his skull. He wanted nothing more than to climb over the offering table and smash his fist through the chieftain's fat face. To make matters worse, John had done little to refute the chieftain's accusations. But why? Why didn't his father stand up for him when he knew his son wasn't seeking glory? Rin turned to his father with an accusatory glare. Meeting his gaze for a moment, John stepped forward. My son speaks the truth. The chieftain laughed. <laughs> then you're as big a fool as he is. If you do not believe him, John suggested, send a party to the surface. Chieftain Errol, squinty eyes widened. And sacrifice them all to the Ice Witch? Now I see where your son inherits his madness. I will not send any more Ice Dwellers to perish. A lesson you should have learned from your brothers and uncles. Rin had heard enough. He turned on his heel and marched out of the chamber before he did something they would all regret. Marcus tried his best to keep up with John and Rin. He was getting better at walking across the ice, but it had been a long day, 
and his legs were tiring from the strain of pulling each foot free with every step. They walked up a steep, dark tunnel, lit by the occasional glowing ice crystal. Marcus had no idea where he was or how to get back to John's dwelling. He only hoped he wouldn't lose his way. John was several paces ahead of him, and Rin and his dog were even further along. Ura's brother had been in a foul mood ever since leaving the council chamber. If it were at all possible, Rin's cold silence had made the boat ride across the lake even gloomier. Rin, slow down, John called as he stopped to wait for Marcus. The boy cannot walk as fast as us, Marcus cringed, wishing John hadn't pointed out his incompetence. He didn't want to give Rin more fuel for his anger. So, despite the burning pain in his legs, he tried to move faster. Rin turned and marched back to them with enviable ease. Marcus could not mistake the hatred bubbling beneath the surface of his eyes, the same look of disdain that father had given Alec on numerous occasions. I am tired and wish to retire to my bed, Rin nodded toward Marcus. Or does this sulking giant now sleep beneath my furs? John held out a hand. Son, I ask that you reign in your temper. He has lived above the surface. I am sure he has seen the Thor. Rin pointed an accusatory finger at Marcus. You could have defended me, land dweller. Tar whimpered beside Rin, looking from his master to John and Marcus. Clearly, the dog was not looking forward to a confrontation. Neither was Marcus. He swallowed as he worked to steady his trembling limbs. He did not want Rin to drive him away now because he needed time to heal before he scaled Ice Mountain. Marcus shook his head. I have seen none of what you speak. Rin stormed over and jabbed him in the chest. Spring has come early this year. Or have you been too busy slaughtering defenseless animals to notice? Marcus froze. Instinct told him to push back, but somewhere in the back of his mind he couldn't escape the nagging feeling of guilt. That he was a monster, just like his father. Rin! Marcus flinched as John stepped between them, glaring at his son. For some reason, Marcus expected him to punch Rin, or at the very least push him to the ground. So, he was surprised when John gently pushed his son until he stepped away. Rin turned to his father, his features twisted in a look of pain. You back down to that Errol slog when I needed you most! Rin! John heaved a sigh. Swaying the council takes time. We do not have time! Rin held out both hands and pointed to the icy walls around them. Will none of you listen? He turned back to Marcus and spoke in an accusatory tone. Have you not travelled down the Danae to the neighbouring villages, and seen how the river swells? Marcus shrugged. I have only ever travelled to Kaislin. Then you are of no use to me. To any of us, Rin spat. I sleep in my own bed tonight, and you may make a bed on the floor. He turned, and marched back up the tunnel, with the dog following behind him. John knelt down beside Marcus, with a look of concern in his pale eyes. Are you sure you will be comfortable? Looking away, Marcus had wanted to say that the attention John lavished upon him was far more uncomfortable than a hard floor, but he kept quiet. After all, he was indebted to John and Ura for saving him and nursing his injuries. I have slept on harder surfaces than this many a time on the hunt. Marcus was lying on a makeshift cart of raised furs on the floor of the chamber at the front of the dwelling where he'd first seen Ura arguing with Bane. To his left were two door flaps. One led to Rin's chamber and the other to what John had jokingly referred to as the brewing room, but it was more like a cramped hole with a wooden bucket in the centre. The family actually used the room to relieve themselves. To Marcus's right were two more door flaps. Marcus assumed they led to the chambers of Ura and John. Facing him was yet another door, the exit to the dwelling. 
which was covered with a heavy drape resembling the slick coat of a fish. John sat beside Marcus and placed the warming stone next to him. Here, this will keep you warm tonight. All you need to do is to close your eyes and will it to warm you. Will it? asked Marcus, puzzled as to how he could make an object do his bidding. Imagine the stone is warming your bed, John said, picking it up and closing his eyes. Within a few seconds, the stone turned a glowing pink. John opened his eyes and handed it to Marcus. Marcus was amazed as warmth radiated all around him. Now ask it to keep you warm tonight, John said. Marcus stared down at the glowing rock in his hand. Do I ask it out loud? John shrugged. You may say it to yourself. Marcus closed his eyes and murmured to himself, asking the stone to keep him warm. To Marcus's surprise, it pulsated in his hand. Smiling, Marcus slipped the warm stone beneath the furs. Do you sleep here too? Marcus wondered, feeling slightly awkward that John was sitting beside him. The narrow cot of furs looked only big enough to sleep one person. John shook his head. No, I only wait for Ura. I will retire to my chamber when she returns. Do you mind waiting up with me? Nay, Marcus answered. For sure he would not sleep until he knew Ura had returned safely. John rubbed the deep lines etched into his narrow forehead. Marcus thought how John seemed to care for his children, how he showed them love and patience, even when they did not always seem to consider his feelings. If Marcus had run off as Ura had done, or spoken as Rin had, he knew his own father wouldn't have been so understanding. I think you're a good father, Marcus blurted out, hardly realising he was sharing his feelings with John before it was too late. He paused, feeling the heat creep into his chest and face as he stole a glance at John. The man was smiling back at him, and he had that same caring look in his eyes that he gave to his own children. Marcus dropped his voice to barely a whisper. My father would have beaten me to a pulp if I'd have spoken to you as Rin had. Or even worse, his father would have beaten Alec to a pulp and forced Marcus to watch. John leaned over and clasped Marcus's shoulder. A father need not beat his son to teach him a lesson. Marcus nearly choked on the rising tide of emotion that threatened to overwhelm him. Thinking about the unfair hand that life had dealt him and his brother. If his father had only been more like John, how different their lives would have been. Mayhap he wouldn't have felt the need to take out his frustrations on animals, and he would have never evoked Medea's wrath. Ura and Rin did not realise their good fortune. I wish my father had been more like you, he said. John levelled Marcus with a knowing expression in the tight lines around his eyes. Did he beat you often? Nay, he beat my brother, Marcus rasped, but could say no more. Alec? John asked. Unable to form words, Marcus simply nodded. He leaned forward and clutched his chest, overcome by an arrow of shame that pierced his heart. What would John and his family think of him if they knew how father had beaten Alec? while he did nothing. Then he remembered Diana's accusations that night of his celebration, that he would grow into a monster, just like his father. He had already brought a curse upon his family. His mother was dead, his brother alone, and possibly dead as well. Do you miss him? Marcus looked at John through a misty gaze. That was when he realised he'd been crying. He swiped at the moisture beneath his eyes and turned away, ashamed to have shown his weakness. Aye, it pains me to speak of him, he replied, wishing John would leave him in peace so he could bottle his dark thoughts and cease his foolish tears. Behind him, John heaved an audible sigh. You have a good heart, son.
<laughs> a bitter laugh escaped Marcus's throat, and he glanced back. I do not think so. John dropped his hands to his sides as his eyes grew cloudy. The icy fortress you've built around your heart will thaw as your wounds heal. Marcus peered down at his wounded arm, still bound in a sling. Not those wounds, son, said John. Your father has wronged you and your brother, but that does not mean you must grow to be like him. The soft sound of footsteps crunching on ice could be heard from outside the dwelling. As if they were of one mind, both men looked toward the door. John rose and walked across the threshold. Pulling open the door covering, he peered outside and then turned to Marcus with a slight smile. In time, you will see my words are true. Ura was not surprised to find her father and Marcus waiting up for her when she returned home. While it brought her a measure of comfort to know she had a family who cared for her, she did not wish for any company right now. She only sought the solace of a warm bed and hoped they would not pester her with questions. Father, having much experience gauging her dark moods, must have sensed her irritation. He simply kissed her on the forehead and wished her a good night before retiring to bed. Marcus, on the other hand, glared at her from across the chamber, where he sat atop a makeshift cot. Marcus was not her nursemaid, keeper, or lover, so he had no right to look as if she owed him an explanation. She averted her gaze while crossing the threshold toward her chamber, and then swore when he stood up and blocked her path. She tried to swat him away, but he would not budge. Where have you been? His tone was not stern or angry, but more like that of a wounded animal. This land dweller was so puzzling. He was as solid as stone and as soft as moss. Ura heaved a frustrated sigh as she looked into his brooding eyes. If you must know, I went to see Odu, the prophet. She nodded. Did he help you? Ura rubbed her aching temple, but it did little to purge her puzzling thoughts. I go there seeking answers, but mostly I leave more confused than before. Marcus's darkened glare softened. So why do you go? Ura sank onto the cot. She'd had such a wearying day. Her brother's homecoming should have been one of joy and celebration but his troubling news only heaped more worry and sorrow upon her shoulders. That was why she had sought the prophet's guidance. Fool she had been to believe this time the swirling mists would give her answers. Ura hung her head in her hands and spoke toward the fur-lined floor. Sometimes Odu sees things, Marcus, things that may come to pass. I thought he might know what is to become of us. She heard Marcus's sharp intake of breath as he sat beside her. And what did you find? More questions, more riddles, more possibilities, she growled as the thick tension behind her skull threatened to break free. She wanted so badly to throw or hit something or just run away. Ura sat up and looked into Marcus's eyes and for the first time she allowed herself to wonder what life would have been like for the two of them if she had not once seen her own death in the swirling mists. Would she have allowed their touch to mean something more? She shook her head and purged all foolish thoughts of love. He sounds as frustrating as his brother, Marcus grumbled. When Ura saw Marcus reach out to clasp her hand, she sprung to her feet. Yes. But he means well. She paced the centre of the chamber, across a snow bare rug, worn to a dull brown with age and use. Did you know he was the one who saved the ice people from Medea? Marcus arched a brow. No. How? Ura stopped pacing and sank down onto the rug, her bones weary. Soon she would need to seek the comfort of her bed. He was not from our village but he came upon my ancestors soon after Medea had unleashed her dragon. 
He brought the survivors to safety beneath the ice and gave warming stones to the four most powerful families. So there are only four stones? Marcus asked. Five. Odu has one. Marcus's eyes widened. Your family is fortunate to be one of the few. Ura swallowed before averting her gaze. Before the Aeral clan claimed the chieftain, my family was once the most powerful in Ice Kingdom. She hated talking about her past, and how her ancestors' sacrifice not only cost them their lives, but catapulted the Errol clan to power. What happened? Tears threatened at the backs of Ura's eyes. My father was just a boy when my grandfather and uncles first set out to prove the ice was melting. They never returned. Odu believes the witch destroyed them. I'm sorry, Marcus's eyes squinted as he tilted his head. I don't understand. Even then the ice was melting. Yes, but at a much slower rate than it is now. And then it stopped for a time. Suddenly, Ura remembered the messenger who had come from the council chamber with word of her brother's meeting, and she scowled as a new wave of anger surged through her. <sighs> When I was with Odu, word came that the council refused to believe my brother's claims. Aye, Marcus nodded. The chieftain said it was all a hoax to reclaim the family's glory. Ura shot to her feet. A roar erupted from her throat. That is a lie! I know, Ura. Marcus held out his hands in what looked to be a calming gesture. I can see your brother is in earnest. Ura turned her gaze and clenched her fists at her sides, doing her best to regain composure. Letting her anger get the best of her would do her family no good. Thank you, Marcus. It means a lot to me that you believe him. Ura inhaled a shaky breath. Looking back at him, her hushed voice sounded much like a plea. Now... How do I convince my people that Rin speaks the truth? Thank you for listening. What did you think? I really hope you enjoyed that. And I would be absolutely delighted if you grabbed yourself a copy over on iTunes or on Audible. If you'd like any more information at all, if you have any questions, any thoughts, do just leave me a message. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And for now, take care. And read to you soon.